I'll tell you what, when you look around Miami right now, things are changing pretty rapidly. As you can see right behind me, there's a huge building going up and I'm over here in North Bay Village. Right across the street, they're starting to develop another one. And I have seen several other new towers starting to crop up here since I've been gone for a few months. And it seems like things just pop up out of nowhere. And it's always funny because it seems like as soon as the housing bus cycle starts to come into play, that's when you start seeing all the new buildings pop up. It was kind of the same thing last time here in Miami although at a much larger scale and I feel like we're just doomed to repeat history now that you're seeing all these brand new buildings come up at a time when home prices here are finally starting to go down anyways that's an interesting observation I wanted to share with you guys before getting into the video because I saw an interesting comment from one of my viewers the other day talking about how they are a lender they write loans for a living like mortgages and he says that his refinance business is booming right now. Eight out of the most recent 10 deals that he has done are refi deals. You would never think that that's the case, right? Because interest rates are high, so why are people refinancing? Well, here's what he says. Eight out of my 10 deals this month are refi. People are trading in their 3% for 8% because they can no longer qualify for a home equity loan and it's their only option to consolidate debt and not lose their home. There is still refinancing business out there as long as people have equity and access to credit. Wow, guys, if that's not dropping the bomb, I don't know what is because this was on the video I was talking about the other day how a lot of mortgage lenders are folding up shop right now because their business has been cut in half if not more and it's interesting to see that there are still some people out there like him that are thriving right now under this environment so I wanted to kind of take a deeper look into why people would be refinancing right now in going from a 3% to an 8% rate well obviously the comment gave part of it away that this is the only way for people to consolidate their debt okay and we know that consumers are going into record amounts of debt right now just to stay afloat in today's economy and it's what people need to do in order to fight inflation the only way to continue with their cost of living in a lot of cases is to just go further and further into debt which is bad news but let's take a look at why people can't actually qualify for a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit right now. Now here's the first thing that could easily be affecting people's ability to get a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. In order to qualify for home equity financing, lenders often require you to own at least 15% of your home outright, okay? And so let's say you live in an area where home prices have been coming down recently and you only put 10% down on your property, there's a good chance that you maybe never even had 15% equity in the house to begin with. And now that prices are coming down, you definitely don't have it. And so one of the main issues, like I tell people time and time again, of why it's probably a good idea to put a higher amount down on your property. 20% down should be sufficient in many cases. Even though it's not required, it can help you out if you end up needing to access this money for whatever reason. But the problem is most people don't have the money to put down a 20% down payment. So they go for an FHA at 3.5% or a, they do a conventional at 5% or 10% down. But then if you end up needing to get one of these loans in the future, you can't. So say you got lucky and you got that 3% mortgage rate and you want to pull money out of the property, well, tough. You can't do it. Your only option is going to be to refinance that property at a higher rate and lose that 3% mortgage. The next one that you need to have to qualify for a home equity loan is you need to have a solid credit score, at least in the mid 600s. Now, this shouldn't be an issue for people who bought recently and have maintained paying their bills on time but say you bought a home a while ago and your credit has since gone in the toilet you might not have a good credit score anymore and even if you have the equity you still won't qualify to get one of these loans so once again your only option will be to trade in your three percent for today's beautiful eight percent mortgage but i think the real kicker is this one and this is what's actually making it so most people don't qualify for these home equity loans, and that is the debt to income ratio. 
okay? Usually the maximum debt to income ratio you can have to qualify for any sort of home equity product is 43%. This is likely the deal breaker because people have been taking on tremendous amounts of debt recently, especially in the credit card department. You know, credit card debt has absolutely been surging over this past year. But also you combine it with people having a $1,000 a month car payment and also having their mortgage payment. And then you throw in a couple of credit card bills. Next thing you know, your debt to income ratio is far beyond 43% for most people. If that's the case, you're done guys. You're not getting that home equity loan. And this makes perfect sense because lenders are gonna look at you as too high of a risk because if you're already putting more than half of your money towards debt right now, and that goes based on your gross income, by the way, so it's definitely more than half of your take home pay is going towards debt if you have a 43% debt to income ratio. And lenders look at that as too big of a risk. They're not gonna give you that home equity loan, but they'll gladly give you a refinance right now because they're jumping you from a 3% rate to an 8% rate. So that's making them a ton of money. Not to mention the origination fees and closing costs they're able to get from you on top of all of that. And even though 15% is the minimum that the lenders want to see to give you one of these loans in equity, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes they want to see more equity, especially right now that banks have been tightening up credit. So they want to see more equity and they want to see a good, stable income so they know you're going to be able to pay the bills. So I figured this would be an important thing to bring up because you know one thing I keep hearing all the time is oh there's no way anybody's going to give up their 3% mortgages. Well, clearly that's not true. If the bulk of somebody's mortgage lending business right now is refinancing people from a 3% rate to an 8% rate. That's something that you would never imagine would be happening and I wasn't even aware of until I heard about this. But once you start digging into the details of what you need in order to qualify to even get a home equity loan, it starts making perfect sense. Now, another thing I wanted to bring up is for everybody who watched my video from the other day talking about the National Association of Realtors lawsuit and how uh, this lawsuit was recently won by home sellers when it comes to paying commissions. I went through the comments and I saw a lot of people say things that don't make any sense, guys. Now. I'm not gonna go into all of them or details on it, but I wanted to touch on one recurring theme that I saw a lot in the comments. I saw a lot of comments saying that, oh, why do I need to have a buyer's agent when I can just go on Zillow or Redfin right now and just look at all of the listings for sale myself and do all the research myself? Okay, fair point. But one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that wasn't always the case and that can change overnight. All right, when I first started in real estate at the beginning of 2009, uh, sites like Zillow and Trulia were just beginning. I don't think Redfin even existed yet. And they were in their infancy and these websites were very janky to say the least. They didn't work very well. They didn't have all the listings and a lot of times the information that they had was inaccurate. But little by little, as the years started going by, they started accumulating uh, more listings from different MLSs across the country and their info started getting better and more reliable. Their interface started getting better. I don't think most people understand that the only reason that it's possible for you to actually go on Zillow or Redfin today and look at listings on there is because the National Association of Realtors combined with different MLS boards, different local realtor associations across the country, they share that information with Zillow and Redfin. And if it wasn't for them sharing that info with those companies, those guys would be out of business overnight. If, if they start revoking MLS access tomorrow, guys, those websites would only be left with for sale by owner listings and that's it, which would essentially put them out of business because a large part of their business model is also that they want you, the buyer, to get in touch with a real estate agent through there and then they will sell those leads to real estate agents. So essentially real estate agents are being sold their own clients on their own listings, which has always been a scam if you ask me. So now that things are gonna get tougher for realtors, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of MLS boards start revoking access of their listings. So that way, the only way you can see what's listed on the MLS is to work directly with a real estate agent. I would not be surprised at all 
if that ends up being the next move in order to basically force people into using a real estate agent because right now they're gonna be like okay you don't want to pay us fine you're not gonna be able to use our data or see any of our listings and that's the only reason that people know everything about all these properties and what's for sale out there because when I started these websites were in their infancy like I said and it was still very commonplace for people to walk into the office and you would just sit down with them by the computer show them different listings that are available on the MLS and even though people knew that these websites existed number one a lot of people didn't trust them yet because they were not proven and the other thing is uh, half people didn't know about it. So they thought, well, the only way to find out about what's available for sale is I gotta go into a real estate office. So I think a lot of people just are out of touch with how this system actually works. And it might be easy to say you don't need a real estate agent now, but if it becomes impossible for you to look at listings online anymore, you will be forced to need a real estate agent. So get ready for that, guys. That's, that's not like insider information. That's just a prediction of where I think things could go from here based on this current situation. But look out for it because I would not be surprised at all within another year from now if this lawsuit holds, if the appeal doesn't go through from the National Association of Realtors, a lot of the MLS data is going to be getting pulled and will remain proprietary like the way it always was before any of these websites existed. And the reality is a lot of these guys got greedy. You know, like the realtor associations agreed to share their data with uh, Zillow and Redfin and all these sites for money, okay? They pay them for the data. The realtor associations and the NAR are gonna have to take a strong look at, okay, do we make more money from these fees selling our data or do we make more money from real estate commissions? But I understand the sentiment. I understand how people feel very independent these days with all the information that's publicly available. It makes sense, right? And a lot of people don't know the history of why these websites are able to exist to begin with. But I just want to let you know that all that can be revoked with the stroke of a pen, guys. It can be gone tomorrow, and that's it. No more Zillow, no more Redfin, no more anything. would we'll just be down to for sale by owner listings websites. That's it. Now I saw this story the other day that's a big warning sign for the US because a lot of this could be coming straight over here and it was about how the household wealth in the UK has been falling pretty substantially over the past two years due to high interest rates. Well, how do high interest rates make household wealth go down, Michael? Well, let's take a look. There's a company called Resolution Foundation and they found out that the median household wealth in the UK fell 21% from the start of 2022 all the way through the third quarter of 2023. And this fall is due to the part of the large percentage of wealth being tied up in home values and pension accounts, which is also something we have in common with the UK here in the US. The lion's share of wealth is tied up in the real estate market and the stock market and pension accounts. And all of these things are susceptible to interest rate hikes. In the UK, pensions so far have been hit the most because over there, 80% of all household wealth is held in home equity and pension plans alone. And both of those things have surged in value over the past 40 years. But right now, pensions are getting hit the hardest, and that's because the pensions are heavily invested in government bonds in the UK. And in case you're not paying attention with what's been happening with the bond market, bonds that were sold two, three years ago are practically worthless now because of how high the interest rates have gone up. So that's really bad news if you're a pension fund that owns these bonds. Home values have still been holding up pretty strong over there, just like here, but eventually they believe that home prices are going to succumb to these high interest rates, especially in the UK, because it's very common for people to have to refinance their homes every five years or so. And here in the US, things aren't really that different. In fact, according to a study done by the Federal Reserve, in 2022, about 75% of household assets were in retirement accounts and home equity. 75%. So not too far away from our neighbors across the pond at 80%. And here, just like over there, U.S. pension funds are major holders of U.S. Treasury securities and they also are seeing a huge decline in the value of their old bonds due to rising interest rates. Even in 2022, the world's top 300 retirement funds fell about 13% which was the worst decline 
since the financial crisis of 2008. But things have rebounded since then due to this crazy run up in the market that we've seen. But a lot of high profile guys out there think that the housing market in both places is going to come down substantially. Jeremy Grantham, he predicts the housing market's going to fall by 30%. Uh, Daniel Bustamante, he thinks that home prices are going to fall anywhere between 15 to 20 percent, and that's a conservative estimate, he says. Even though lower prices are good for home buyers who want to get a deal on things, it's not good for household wealth, right? Which is what we're talking about here and how these high interest rates can potentially impact it over time. The UK and the US also have in common that they're likely to continue keeping their interest rates higher for longer into 2024. And so basically, the higher these interest rates are for longer, the more opportunity it's going to have to break more of these systems down, the more it's going to devalue these old bonds, the more pressure it's going to put on the housing market, the more interest it's going to make people who are in debt have to pay. And all those things start compounding over time. And so that's why the longer that the interest rates are higher will have a more significant impact than how high the interest rates actually are. In fact, right now, high interest rates are already hurting these pensions, like we talked about, due to the fact that the older bonds that they're holding are becoming more worthless. And this is likely to continue as interest rates stay higher for longer. And as mortgage rates continue to stay high, it keeps housing more unaffordable. And let's face it, people can't wait forever. Eventually, they're going to want to sell their homes for one reason or another. If inventory continues to build on the market, but mortgage interest rates are still high and people can't afford to buy, guess what's going to happen to the price and the overall home equity of people's homes, guys? It's going to go down. And here's another hidden aspect of this, is this affects baby boomers more than the younger generation because the younger generation has been so unfortunate and not been able to really accumulate much household wealth. Younger generations aren't going to feel the impact from this nearly as much as the baby boomer generation who have the majority of their wealth tied up in these pension plans and home equity. And it's the spending that baby boomers have been doing over these past couple of years that's keeping this economy afloat right now. Because like we talked about before, literally 80% of the GDP in the US is due to consumer spending. And the moment that starts going away, that's the moment you're going to see the recession become official. So hopefully you guys can see how all this is related. These high interest rates can still have some major impacts on our economy due to pension plans losing value, due to homes losing value, ultimately leading to spending going down, which will hurt businesses. More businesses will go out of business or have to reduce staff, which means more layoffs and things just getting worse. And here's something else interesting right now. Zillow recently conducted a study based on affordability and what homes cost right now. And they're saying that it will take you about 13 and a half years to break even on a home purchase that was purchased after July of 2023 due to how high these interest rates are. Basically what they're trying to say here is that this is how long it would take for you to make payments on your house for you to get to a point where you could eventually sell it for a profit. 13 and a half years, guys. I want that number to sink in. 13 and a half years, if you were to buy a house right now today, is how long it's gonna be before you can sell the house for a profit. Why is that the case? Well, back to what we were just talking about, interest rates. This is another way that it destroys household wealth. You're not building equity, guys. I want people to do this. This is a Zillow story. You can type in Zillow mortgage calculator and you can punch in numbers for what it would cost you to get a mortgage today. You can type in your insurance, your property taxes, all this stuff, right? Well, what happens when you do this and then you click on the tab over here that says amortization schedule. When you look at this, your jaw will hit the floor of how much your monthly payment is going towards interest in the very beginning, guys. Look at this. It's basically all of it. And this is the reason why it's gonna take people so long to break even under these circumstances. Which once again, the higher that interest rates are for longer, it's gonna put more people in this position where they essentially won't be able to sell their house without losing money in the near term. And guess what? If mortgage rates end up going over 8%, 
then this changes math because this is based on the high sevens where they were in July. And now they're kind of back down to like the 7.75% rates. Okay, what happens when they go over 8%? You're probably looking at over 15 years to break even. Now, apparently they don't keep historical data on how long the break even durations have been in the past, but typically it's around four to six years. Okay, four to six years is the norm. Today, it's 13 and a half to 15, depending on your rate. So this is gonna mean that people who are buying houses today are essentially going to be trapped in their homes if they're not putting down massive down payments or if they're not buying in areas that are appreciating in value right now and will help them move that timeline up because not all markets face this problem. Uh, they say that if you were to buy in San Francisco, for example, with only a 5% down payment, then you could break even in as little as seven and a half years. But when you contrast that with buying in a more affordable market like Cleveland, Ohio or El Paso, Texas, then it's about 20 years. 20 years, guys. You need to stay in that house to sell it for a profit. Who does that? Nobody stays in the house for that long. So to me, this is gonna mean major problems in the housing market in the future as people that bought recently had no idea that this was the case. And when they finally realize it, when it's time to sell, that they're basically not gonna make any money, they're gonna be losing money, it's either gonna, number one, make them not sell, or if they have to, they'll have no choice and have to take that loss. I think it's just a matter of time before we're gonna see some major shifts in this economy and ultimately that will spill over into the housing market with you know, people's overall wealth going down and these interest rates are going to be at the root of all of it. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here and I'll see you in the next one.